Welcome to Java Programming Intensive Session 5. Today, we are going to talk about many different things, uh, including some more advanced topics. So today, we're going to talk about streams, why they're important, and most importantly, how do we use them. So let's get started with uh, streams. When you're watching a video on YouTube or whatever, everybody knows actually that that's known as streaming. And why is it known as streaming? It is because it is input and output that it's really, really long. It's really, it's uh, input and output that uh, is gonna be flowing at you and you might not even know when things might be done or not. It's not like something that you, in ahead of, of time, you know how much you're gonna download or anything like that. It's just data that flows in. This concept initially was envisioned more for like things like uh, UDP as opposed to TCP, if you wanna really get uh, to the nitty gritty of things. But the main thing was that you just needed to have data continuously being sent to you. So that way you don't have to worry about downloading the entire thing and then verifying it. And then, you know, like when you, when you rent a movie on iTunes or when you are downloading a video on YouTube, when you're watching a video on YouTube, you're not really downloading the entire thing and then playing it. You are just sent data and you are receiving it and processing it as you get it. And that's the most key concept of streaming. You are processing the data as you get it. Interestingly enough, it's also a technique now used in very, in, uh, in uh, big data, architectures where um, things like uh, Kafka, they are oriented for streaming of data. By the way, Kafka is also written in Java. You will know that actually, once you understand that, that it's actually built in with streaming in mind. So the idea is that in this slide, the reason why I put it here, it's just to, to remind you that you might be dealing with small individual chunks of data as opposed to everything all at once. And you are reading it or writing data that it's in that stream, kind of like a river. It just doesn't matter where it's the beginning of the end, it's just how you're getting it. Another real life example of streaming would be other than YouTube and stuff like that, broadcast, television broadcasts. You just connect to the stream and that stream is feeding you with the information that they are streaming. Um, so for this type of thing, then we also need to, to talk about two things. So we need to understand what is binary data and what is text data. So far in our Java class, we have been dealing with both text and binary, but the majority of what we've been dealing with is just text files. And what are text files? Those are files that a human will understand if you read them. For example, HTML, even though there's HTML tags and stuff like that, you cannot just give it to anybody and we'll read it, but it is encoded so that a human can actually edit it and modify it. JSON files, CSVs, all those data files I mean, there's there's way too many, uh, even Java source files, but they're encoded in a way so that a human can read the data and interpret it and use it. In the case of binary data, it is encoded so that the computer can read it easily. I guess, I guess the biggest difference is who's the user. If the user is a computer, then, then it's gonna be encoded towards the computer to do easier its job. If it is for the human, then it's gonna be encoded so that it's easier for the job of a human. Here's a perfect example. Images, JPEG images, PNG images, they are encoded in such a way that the computer can read them fast and interpret them, then display them. It's encoded so that the computer can be efficient. HTML pages, even though they're encoded for the browser, they're also encoded for the developer. You're sending the source code. You're, the source code is not, like if you have some, some uh, content management system or CMS, uh, you're not sending really the source code, but you're streaming or sending to the to the user uh, what the, the HTML. But when HTML was envisioned, it was actually, there were no editors, there were no CMS. It was just, well, we need to come up with a language that a human can write it and without any fancy compilers or any tools can be sent over the internet and could be interpreted by a browser. So there, it's kind of like a little bit of an exception, but a PDF file, for example, is another example of a, of a binary file. The computer understands the way that it should be displayed, and then it renders it that way. I, I usually do this uh, example in my Java class in person. Okay, so if we're looking at our ATM class and we were going to say, let's open up the terminal and 
we can see here that, for example, if I am I am in the out file in this guy in, in wherever IntelliJ compiles things. So if I am going to look at the compiled version of the ATM class, we will see all these weird characters that tells us, yes, there are some strings, but it tells us that it's binary data. You know, like if I want to see also, I don't know, a picture, let's see um, if I download, uh, let me put a uh, picture in this directory. Okay, so I'm going to put this image um, where it's one of my favorite jokes that actually explains uh, what is uh, uh, interpreted language versus uh, compile language. It's the great use of a comma. This is a lot more efficient using commas. Anyway, if, uh, if we do this and we say, uh, if we try to see the contents of this file, it's actually even telling me that it's a binary file and it's just very similar to that class file that we were looking at. When the data is made for the computer to be efficient with, then it is mostly written in binary. Now, other types of content are uh, text. For example, For example, if I go into our source directory and I open up atm.java, the source code is intended for me as a human to write it in human way. So I need to be efficient so that I can write the code in a, as best as possible. Therefore, it's a text file. Why does all that uh, matters? Well, the main thing is because when we are reading data, we got to use the right class. So if you're using, if you want to use binary data, you use anything that ends in input stream and output stream. Those, those are indicate that the classes are used by naming convention to read binary data. So again, we have buffered input stream, which what that class does is that it grabs a cluster of uh, data. Imagine that I'm trying to like deal with this ukulele book and I'm tr gonna try to send it to you. Imagine if I went to the post office and I tore apart every single page and sent it in different envelopes. That would be extremely inefficient. So the easiest thing to do is to send the thing complete as a buffer, as a complete item. So even if there was a restriction on the post office that only, I don't know, I could send like 30 pages, I could do it in three packages as opposed to, uh, I don't know, 60 or 70 packages if, if it was one by one. Buffered is just whenever you have a cluster of data grouped together and sent so that you can be a little bit more efficient, you build a buffer. The buffered input stream, it just gives you the entire thing and it just does it in an efficient manner. You, you offset the capability of how do you read that data to the buffered input stream and you, you know that that's gonna handle it fine and it's gonna do the proper buffering rather than you having to go everything by hand. That's the difference between, and say, a byte input array and a file and a buffer input stream. A byte array input stream, sorry. Uh, and then file input stream and file output stream is just reading a file as if it was a stream rather than, than just going byte by byte or something. It just You just build it as a stream. And then since Java is built around streams, there's plenty of classes that you can use. For example, the scanner that we've used in previous classes, the scanner will treat the same if it is the standard in or it is a file reading data into into the scanner. So it's it's uh, you can use the same or similar interfaces when you actually reuse these type of interfaces. So those were the uh, binary readers. On the character side, on the text uh, side, we have analogous classes to the other one. We have a buffer reader. That means that it's as opposed to the buffered input stream, that the buffered reader is going to grab text and read it in buffer. The other one is going to grab binary data and read it as a, as a buffer. Instead of a byte array input stream, we have a char array reader that it's going to read it in size by size. You can control that size and you, the other one gives you the entire thing, but you know that it's like I said previously, that it's going to be handled correctly. And then the file reader and file writer are analogous to the file input stream and file output stream. 
some of the uh, common methods that are available to all of them is essentially uh, read, write, skip, close, and um, yeah, I'm gonna explain why the there is a skip once we get into random access files. But for now, I wanna show you the very basics. So I am going to build as an exercise an input stream reader that it's going to read from the UCLA extension website and download it. Just basically that's what we're gonna build. So what I'm going to do right here, I'm going to create a new Java class and we're gonna call it UCLA extension site reader. So we are creating our UCLA extension site reader. Okay, so we create a new, uh, what I'm calling the UCLA extension site reader. And I am going to create a public URL uh, site. And then I'm going to, in this case, I'm gonna create a UCLA, well, let's, let's we can do it over here actually, public URL site. Let's move it down here. We're all gonna do it in, in a single, in the same main method. This is not an ideal practice, but I'm doing it um, just for simplicity to not confuse you. And we're gonna uh, surround with try catch. And what we are going to do is that set up a file input file reader. So we are going to get, actually I don't want to, well, so in this case, because it's, I know that, um, well, let's use an input stream reader because at the end of the day, bytes or characters are going to be interpreted similar. It's just like the reader classes are um, much more just oriented towards sex. They remove all any binary stuff. The other one really understands the data in whatever way. So we're going to use an input stream reader and we're going to call it reader equals new um, input. Open stream. That's the one that I was looking for. And it's asking to catch an exception. So we're going to do that. We're also going to catch uh, a catch clause. That's what we select to get this thing going. And then we can do something like while reader has, um, actually that's, I'm going to pass it to a buffer because in this case, well, now let's do it. Let's do this in, in the old school way. So that way you guys understand what, what are the advantages of the, of the reader or not. So, uh, before we used to do something like this. And let's say we're gonna use a hundred uh, k, a hundred uh, characters as, as a buffer. So let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So while um, we're gonna set up something that it's going to be re reader dot, um, we're gonna pass this. We're gonna call this function, and we're gonna say we're gonna try to read into this buffer and say that, actually, what, what is the, this guy returns an int. Okay, int status, or, and we can even, we can even say something like this, int status, and we can, we're gonna move it inside of the while. We're gonna put it like th here, status, and we're going to group it again in another parentheses to say that is different than or greater than minus one because I know by definition that's the, that a read function usually. If we go into into, I wish there was a way to go to the documentation. Maybe there is. Well, there is this that I can go navigate when I press command on a Mac to go in when I'm on top of a definition. So 
uh, it will return the number of characters red or minus one at the end of the stream. So that is why I knew that this guy was a minus one. So while that status is greater than minus one, then we can do system um, buffer. We're gonna print each buffer until we're done collecting that buffer. So if I run it, you're going to see that I am printing the UCLA extension website as it is today. But here's one thing, you're gonna see that my cursor never goes beyond this side. Like it's nothing is ever written here. And that is because there's a limit of a hundred characters, which is this. I mean, technically I could do it at 10 characters and, and do the same thing. And I'm gonna run it just if it was a buffer of 10 characters. But you see how inconvenient it is that you have to be like calculating that. So what I am going to do now is that I'm gonna rewrite this now with a buffered input stream reader. Goes new buffered input stream. And as an input, it takes an, a stream. So what we're gonna use is we're gonna use a popular scanner. Actually, no, let's, let's go for the, first of all, I am gonna do the same code again, now using the beauty of a buffer. So we can set up a buffer reader. Um, reader equals new um, buffer reader with site.openStream. And now that we have our reader, we can do while reader dot. So we're gonna set up our buffer stream reader and we are gonna do, because a buffer reader needs a reader and this is a stream, we need to set up an input stream reader um, saying, um, I don't know, let's say input stream, input stream reader equals new input stream reader. And we'll put this, this, our stream inside because we got to read from a stream. It goes into an input stream reader and this guy reads that buffer, that, that reader. So it buffers that reader rather than us hand, uh, doing it. So um, we can now do while um, reader dot uh, read line or yeah, let's read a line, read the line. And I know that this guy is gonna have a similar thing, but this is actually gonna separate it via, via lines rather than a buffer of whatever characters but we're gonna actually assign it the same way, string line, and we can do line equals this. So now we're gonna line. It's basically the same code, but now rather than it being cut, you can see that there are parts that actually continue going for a while, just because that's the way that the HTML was written. So. A buffer reader doesn't limit us by us doing like this uh, file opening and closing and doing it very by hand. This is just like, just give me the data. And how are we gonna get that data? Let's get it. Now there's a third way of doing the same thing and I'm just showing you for uh, bonus points so that you guys know more about it. But you can use a scanner uh, equals new scanner and uh, new input stream we can do site dot open stream and we import this class. Yeah. Now we can do while scanner dot perfectly incorrectly written. So we're gonna refactor this scanner. There you go. Now we can print scanner by using scanner dot next line. And now we have, we're checking out, we're treating this as if it was a file, but when it's actually a URL. So you see, there's many ways of actually doing this, but that's the beauty of streams. It allows us to use 
many more avenues because streams are supposed to be the big umbrella that catches anything that it's flowing data to you. Now, one of the things that it's beautiful about streams is that you can chain them together because once you chain them, you can uh, create something crazy like this, where we have this URL reader that we just wrote and we want to convert it from a URL into a file, but not only a file, we want it to be a, com a, a compressed file, a gzip file. So how are we going to do that? Well, it's very, 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 very simple. So what we're going to do is that we're going to actually let's use let's use this one. I think it well no because I want I want to prove a point. So I'm gonna reuse the the one that we had before because the sequence matters. Okay, so now we're gonna I'm gonna do it in a I'm using this because I want to prove an actual point. So we're creating this is the way that the data is flowing in, but we want to make sure that that data is also has the information it needs to flow in and flow out. For example, we have this where it's like the internet is sending us data. And then we have our input stream reader. I'm writing it on the side, which input stream reader. And then we send it to another process, which would be our buffered input stream reader. Then at some point we need to perform certain conversion, but we need to have a buffered out and OUT and then send it to a file. And that's kind of like the basic of just to download it. But since we want to go above and beyond, we got to send it to a compressor and then we can save that as a file. But you see, you can see how the data is being chained and how we're going to do it. So we have a buffer here and we have a buffer here. So we're going to create that buffer here that we need to define as an output. So we're going to call it um, buffered output stream. Uh, and we're going to let's say buffered out let's let's look at the documentation just to to prove a point here so if we look at at a buffered output stream we're going to see that the constructor needs an output stream and why is it an output stream because the constructor for inputs is taking this side of the equation so for this guy here let's say for this guy here the thing that it takes into account for the constructor is this guy here. Then for this guy here, the thing that is being taken into account for the constructor of that object is this guy here. But with uh, outputs is backwards because when you're taking, when you're paying attention to this guy here, the part that it, you are looking to, uh, to create is where you're going to plug it into next because it's an output. You can see that essentially this guy is actually it's not even that guy. It's just the conduit that it's connected down here because we are connecting into those outputs. We need to then go ahead and define this output because it needed an output stream, which is the next one. Then we're going to diagram the next one. But because we need to have it described for the constructor to happen, then we need to add it above, which means that our chain of command will be this backward thing for defining those variables. We're going to start. We're going to define it this way, whereas on the input, we did it this way. And it's it's gonna be really interesting. So we're gonna put up we're gonna use a gzip output stream because it needs an output stream, and we call it, we're gonna call it G O, G O U T. And in that output stream, we are going to do a new gzip output stream, and it's gonna need another output stream because we needed to read it in a buffered way. Again, if we go in our plan, we are essentially we're mapping this guy's 
101 and this guy is 101. Basically, well, we don't need, we just need to map these two guys because that's the way that we're connecting our input and our output. Uh, because we want to send it in from that direction and we need to have a buffer so that way that buffer is actually handling the entire, just like I show you, I don't have to worry about these little bits and pieces and chunks. I'm just going to pass the entire buffer to the output stream so the, out, the GZIP output stream knows how to handle it. Okay, so uh, on, on this part, what we gotta do is now that we gotta, you know, we've defined this guy here and we've defined this guy here. Now we need to go after this guy because that's what we're essentially building. So I'm gonna do a file output stream because I am effectively, my plan is to write it into a file. So I am letting the, the buffer handle the entire thing into the, the stream. And then from that, I'm sending it to a file. So I'm going to call it F out because we have multiple outputs. If you can see, because we're chaining them together, we're going to do new file output stream and a file output stream actually just requires UCLA extension .gzip. That's where we're going to store it. So that's our path, our ending path, the file path. Then this guy, we're going to pass it in here and then we're going to put our output stream, new buffered output stream into um, it's going to go that in that direction. Like I said, the information flows that way in this case. Do not confuse this arrow that I drew earlier. This is just how we were going to define them. You can see that we defined first the file, then the compressor, then the B output. And that's basically what we have. File, compressor and output. OK, so now we have these two readers that are a little disconnected. So what we got to do is to connect them. Now we got to work on this part of the puzzle. And in that part of the puzzle, we're going to use here where we are reading that line. But we're, since we are getting a string, we got to send it into, you're going to see that B out is going to, if I want to write, I need to write a byte array because it's it's an output stream rather than a reader. So because it is doing that, we need to convert um, our line, which is line dot get bytes. And that converts a string into a byte array. And that's basically how we do it. We are reading that line and then writing that as bytes into the uh, output writer. And at the very end of it, we got to just make sure that we close our, our output. So now let's run it. And it downloaded something here. So I'm going to reveal in Finder and I'm seeing that it's 21 kilobytes. So if we are in, in where we downloaded our file, which was in the previous over here and we decompress the file, we can see that the file is completely empty. And that when that happens is because I close the incorrect file. So, so then we close the top of the stream. We close, essentially, when we close this faucet at the end of reading, then everything else just flows in, in, into an end. That's, so when we do this and run it, we can see that the, that the website was completely downloaded as a compressed file. So then I would like to talk a little bit about random access files, just for, for um, understanding that this data, um, how this data moves around. So uh, a random access file is basically any data that you can jump around and it is fine if you, if, uh, if you start reading from that point. A perfect analogy is like a regular file is like a, like a novel. You cannot just go into chapter three and understand it. You know, like if you skip, you might as well not read the entire thing. So in the case of a random access file, you can start wherever you want on that file and you can make sense of it from, from that point on. And, and random access files just allows when you 
do the seek function, it allows you to move from one portion to another in the file. An example of uh, that would be uh, an MP3, for example. I mean, not necessarily written as that, but but just to, to explain the concept, an MP3 where you can start whatever in the file, you don't have to read from the beginning of it to start playing. And that's, that's the idea, like when you're watching music or what, a movie or something, you start from a random position and it won't matter if it's in order or not. So that's where the seek function comes in. Uh, seek allows you to move the, the pointer of where you're reading from. So if you move it to zero, you're going to the beginning. If you move it to like 100 characters or whatever, you can move it uh, in, in such direction. 